Um, good afternoon. Welcome to today's event. Confederate monuments are just the tip of the iceberg, plantation museums in Southern heritage tourism. I'm Deborah Lustig, Associate Director of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, a sponsor of today's event. This is our first event of the semester and we're very happy to have our new interim director, Stephen Small, share his research with us. So before we get to that, I want to announce our next event. Alfred Young from the University of Michigan will be speaking on Wednesday, October 7th at 3 p.m. Pacific time. The title is From the Edge of the Ghetto, The Quest of Small City African Americans to Survive Post-Industrialism. And this is a talk that we had to cancel in the spring, so we're happy to do it virtually this fall. And if you'd like more information about that, as well as the event sponsored by ISSI and all our centers, please visit our website. And um, thank you, Maxwell, for putting the link in the chat. So the format of today's event is that um, after I introduce him, Professor Small is gonna talk about his work um, with us. And then we'll have a Q&A led by Monique Hussein, Hossein, sorry, a doctoral candidate in public health here at Cal. And Monique was also part of our graduate fellows program at ISSI. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A feature to post that anytime. And we'll be collecting those questions and Monique will ask as many as possible on your behalf. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Stephen Small. As I mentioned, he's interim director of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues. And he is also a professor of African-American studies here at Cal. He earned his PhD in sociology at UC Berkeley, where he was a graduate student trainee in what is now ISSI's graduate fellows program. So we're very pleased to have him take on this leadership role and be back with us. His publications include numerous journal articles, as well as chapters and edited volume, volumes. And he's also the co-editor of three books, Global Mixed Race, New Perspectives on Slavery and Colonialism in the Caribbean, and Black, Afri Black Europe and the African Diaspora. His most recent book, 20 Questions and Answers on Black Europe, was published in 2018. He's currently co-writing a book with Dr. Kwame Namako on public history, museums, and slavery in England and the Netherlands. And his very related project is yet another book, <laughs> tentatively titled Inside the Shadows of the Big House, 21st Century Antebellum Slave Cabins and Heritage Tourism in Louisiana. And he will be sharing material from that project today. So now let me turn things over to Stephen. Okay. So I'm set now, am I, Deborah? Okay, your microphone is off. Oh, I guess that's the way it's going to be. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you to Deborah, to Max, and to Monique. Uh, and thank you for everyone uh, for taking part in today's presentation. It's my first presentation as interim director of the Institute, so I hope I can do a good job and give you an idea of some of the things that the Institute does and has achieved. And certainly it's benefited me uh, since I was a graduate fellow more than 30 years ago. Okay, so Confederate monuments are just the tip of the iceberg. In the United States today, debates around Confederate monuments, statues, and the Civil War have pushed the history of slavery and its ongoing legacies to the forefront of public consciousness. These debates are taking place against the horrific backdrop of murder and violence against African Americans often in the name of white supremacy. There are thousands of monuments to the Confederacy across the United States South in government, public and private buildings, and in cemeteries. There are also schools, street names, and a vast number of private houses that honor overwhelmingly male Confederate heroes and events. For many people, especially in the US South, the monuments function largely as positive and celebratory and celebratory identity symbols and heritage sites. It's also clear that a significant number of people embrace these monuments to provoke, antagonize, and aggravate black people. 
and as a means to express their unreserved belief in white supremacy. Recent surveys in the United States indicate that a majority of Americans want these monuments kept in place. Several politicians have defended the monuments. Many others simply kept silent, while a few politicians have acted to remove them from public display. Yet specialists of public history in the US, specifically on slavery in the Civil War, know that Confederate monuments are little more than the tip of the iceberg. A far more extensive and impactful infrastructure made up of physical sites dedicated to creating a distorted, problematic, and even mythological memory of US slavery, the Confederacy, and Southern history stands steadfastly in place. This infrastructure I call the Plantation Museum Heritage Infrastructure, an infrastructure that consists of thousands of heritage sites comprised of mansion houses, outbuildings, workspaces like kitchens, and so-called slave cabins. These are physical structures that can be found in all southern states. They can be visited on guided and unguided tours, and they attract millions of domestic and international visitors right now each year. Since the 1990s, I've personally visited more than 200 plantation museum sites in more than 10 states, including the biggest plantation site. Oops, let me get rid of this. Oh, what have I done here? Hmm, how do I get rid of that? I see. Excuse me a moment, little technical problem. Oh, now this has gone off. So worse. It's okay. okay. Thanks for going. Okay. So I've visited more than 200 of these sites, including the biggest, which is Nottaway Plantation in Louisiana. The most visited site, which is Oak Alley Plantation, also in Louisiana. And the most photographed site, which is Boone Hall Plantation, currently in South Carolina. My colleague Jennifer Eichstadt and I, for one of our earlier books, also did research at several plantation museum sites that belong to US presidents, including Mount Vernon and Monticello, which you see here. I visited so-called slave villages in Florida and Louisiana, slave streets and slave quarters in South Carolina. I've also visited Uncle Tom's cabin, if you can believe that, in Maryland, though unfortunately I don't have a photo to share with you today. Now, despite the apparent differences across these states, they share, in my opinion, some striking similarities in their narrative and visual strategies. And since 2005, my primary focus has been on Louisiana, especially on sites that have slave cabins. And for reasons of time, I'm going to concentrate on Louisiana primarily today. Now, Louisiana has some of the biggest and most visited sites in the United States. During slavery, Louisiana produced more than 90% of all sugar in the United States. It had some of the largest plantations and in the antebellum period had a higher concentration of millionaires on the river road who had become rich from slavery than any other state. Information at these sites focuses on architecture, interiors and furnishing and on decorative gardens. All narratives at the sites privilege gendered white elites with detailed descriptions of their social roles, their experiences, and the aspirations of elite white men that were plantation owners, like presidents, governors, senators, and senior military personnel. They also highlight elite white writers, painters, and artists, as well as important political events like US independence and the Civil War. They focus on elite white women in domesticity, family, and philanthropy. Overall, the sites consistently avoid, disregard, or sideline mention of slavery and the experiences of the enslaved. If slavery is mentioned at all, it's typically described in passive, general, and abstract ways. And if mentioned at all, black people are typically appearing as an undifferentiated, stereotypical mass. 
with one or two exceptions. These goals at the different sites are achieved through what I call three narrative start strategies or narrative styles. The first narrative style is symbolic annihilation, which means that the sites totally and completely ignore the institution and experience of slavery, or they treat them in ways that are negligible, formalistic, or fleeting. Stereotypes at these sites are common, smiling slaves in the fields, smiling slave women in kitchens. For example, at one site, after spending 40 to 60 minutes describing elite white men and women and how they were good, loving, and generous slave masters, a tour guide suddenly stopped and mentioned there were several faithful and dedicated slaves on the, on the plantation. Other tour guides may offer a simple statement like pointing at a chair and saying a slave made this chair. Or they may just say there are slave cabins at the back of the house. The second narrative style is marginalization. And this occurs when there is only perfunctory, momentary or short-lived mention or reference to slavery. Slavery is mentioned in ways that may be literal, trivializing or dismissive. It's common in this narrative style to foreground faithful slaves and the benevolence of plantation owners. They say slightly more than symbolic annihilation, but not a lot more. In this narrative style, the passive tense is widely used. We are told, for example, that in kitchens, in order to test the heat of an oven, a hand would be placed inside it until it was too hot. In the dining room, we are told that a boy would wait at the table and waft a large fan to keep flies off the food during meals. That a servant delivering food from the outside kitchen was required to whistle so that they could not sample the food. At Butler Greenwood Plantation, for example, the slave master is described as a kind and thoughtful man who gave the enslaved a free day from work on Sundays and generously provided additional provisions at Christmas. This generosity was received much to the delight of the enslaved who sang and danced in happiness. At several of the plantations, we're told that when slavery ended, many enslaved people stayed on the plantation to be close to the family that they had worked for and because they loved them so much. The third narrative style is relative incorporation in which slavery and the lives of the enslaved are described explicitly, systematically, and are far more incorporated into the overall presentation. Details of the slave cabins are provided. We are told about the work and family relationships between the owners and the enslaved. At Frogmore and Evergreen plantations, the guided tours actually begin at the slave cabins rather than at the mansion house or gift store, which is quite typical. It's made clear that the plantations would not have been profitable or even existed if it had not been for the exploited and subordinated labor of enslaved Africans and African-Americans. On the relative incorporation, individualizing, personalizing, and humanizing information on the enslaved is provided, names, family connections, work roles, and some mention is made of escape, of rebellion, or of legally free black people. By the way, the most well-known site in this third category, and one that could even be called full incorporation rather than relative incorporation, is Whitney Plantation, which opened in 2013. At Whitney Plantation, in stark contrast to all the others, brutality, violence, and economic exploitation are central features of the narrative, as is resistance and rebellion. Confederate memorials across the South function to symbolically or literally annihilate the facts and the context of US slavery. Confederate memorials function to obfuscate and distort these facts. And they function to turn our attention to a far more narrow, self-congratulatory set of priorities and issues. They focus on white people's economic, political, and social priorities on the bravery, honor, and sacrifice of white men, often in defense of white women, and on their efforts to preserve a beloved society. 
Confederate memorials are heavily gendered and masculinized, and they foreground both elite and working class whites who are named, personalized, and humanized in highly individualist ways. In other words, the universe of discourse at Confederate memorials is extremely narrow, and they continue to operate under the thrall of Southern gentility, civility, and progress. While black people at these memorials remain unmentioned, faceless, and voiceless. In other words, these memorials operate through strategies of symbolic annihilation, marginalization, and deflection. And it's important to note that many of these memorials and statues were built long after slavery legally ended. White economic dominance and political power during Jim Crow provided the fuel for the proliferation of memorials throughout the South. It also provided foundation for the contemporary distribution of resources at these memorials at the present time. Similarly, I argue at plantation museum sites, similar strategies and representations exist. State and institutional support exists for what can only be described as hegemonic narratives across Louisiana, across Louisiana, and indeed across the entire South. The sites function in much the same way as the Confederate memorials, dedicated to white Southern ideology and self-aggrandizement. Silence, evasion, erasure, and annihilation are common at these sites, along with code words, euphemisms, and circumlocution. All of these strategies are the sharpest tools in a fully stocked toolkit of misrepresentation. Plantation sites minimize, marginalize, or remain silent on slavery. They avoid mention of brutality and the inherent injustice of slavery. They personalize and humanize elite white men and to a lesser degree, elite white women, while they depersonalize and dehumanize black people. They too operate under the thrall of a, a class-based Southern gentility, which puts an inordinate emphasis on wealthy and powerful whites. Now, I'm not saying that Confederate memorials and plantation sites are identical. They are not. Confederate memorials clearly appear far more extreme in their representations of white supremacy, and they focus on far more narrow and highly circumscribed topics. Plantation sites, in contrast, generally avoid these e extremes, and they offer a more generic, more nuanced, and less explicitly socially co corrosive narrative, with some variations, as I've just described. So what I contend then is that plantation museum sites are far more impactful and consequential than Confederate monuments. They are far more impactful because of their vast infrastructure, because of the more subtle and indirect narratives deployed, and because of the massive numbers of visitors, domestic and international. These plantation sites generate vast amounts of revenue, economic activity, and employment. And so far, they fail to attract the kind of public or national attention that Confederate memorials and monuments have received. The sites in Louisiana, which I've described today, are indicative of common practices at most sites in all the Southern states, as recent research has revealed. The story is not all bad. Despite the prevalence of memorials and plantation sites, these hegemonic narratives do not go unchallenged. I suspect that Confederate memorials offer few direct opportunities for more accurate, comprehensive, and inclusive histories. That is not their goal. But plantation museum sites, I believe, do offer that potential. Information at these sites is slowly changing, more engaged and critical narratives have emerged, and oppositional and counter narratives exist outside these sites. Let me mention just three types of activity. First, there is significant information at the plantation sites that could provide more accurate, more comprehensive, and more inclusive narratives. Sites that deploy relative incorporation as a narrative style, I believe, are exemplary. Slave cabins at these sites 
also have a great deal of potential for a more expansive narrative. Slave cabins past and present are deeply ambiguous spaces. On the one hand, they were built for the profit, power, and aggrandizement of master enslavers and their families. They also operated at locations of social control, persecution, including sexual violence. But on the other hand, slave cabins also functioned as a refuge for the enslaved. They functioned as a focal point of black agency, including creative adaptations of language, religion, and music, of family, and of numerous forms of resistance and rebellion. Today, the existence of slave cabins at these sites could provide opportunities for undermining distortions, neglect, and erasure. These slave cabins and the plantation sites offer spaces in which we can learn far more about the thoughts and feelings, the inspirations and aspirations, the hopes and dreams, and the actions of black women and men. And it's not an accident that widespread resistance to enslavement and the planning of rebellions mainly occurred in the cabins and the so-called slave quarters. And it's a fact that we have substantial primary evidence about these activities in both documentary and material sources. Over the last decade, some plantation sites that had previously ignored or marginalized cabins have brought them to the foreground and deployed them to tell more inclusive stories. As an example of this potential, I highlight the plantation Melrose, which is in the northwest of Louisiana. This plantation offers a rich indication of the kind of transformative material that could be revealed by a focus on black life and on the majority of people that resided on all of these plantations. Now, Melrose Plantation, I have to tell you, is the most complicated site I've ever, I've ever visited. Melrose belonged to a legally free family of color, the Metoye family. And this family owned more enslaved persons than any other legally free people of color in the South. That's to say, they own more than 300 enslaved persons. Currently, most of the information at the site is organized around the lives of three exceptional women, Marie-Therese Quan Quan, Kemi Henry, and Clementine Hunter, each of whom is closely identified with Melrose Plantation. Now at this site at Melrose, discussion of elite and highly exceptional women is absolutely central to the site, and yet it's overwhelmingly elite women. There's almost no discussion of gender, allocated gender roles and institutions. There's little or no attention to working white women or to enslaved women. So it's a strange sight. Okay. Mary, uh, sorry, Clementine Hunter. Mm, let me see. Here. Okay, so the African house is a house on site. Wait a minute, I'm not sure I like this. Uh, let me see. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so let me stay with this. So this is Melrose Plantation. You have the main house to the top right. You have a writer's cabin. Then you have underneath what's called the African house and then the Ghana house. Now in the African house, there are a series of murals by Clementine Hunter. She painted these murals uh, late in the 20th century. She was born in the 1880s, 1890s, and she lived, I believe, to the 1960s. I'll have to confirm that date. Okay, but uh, uh, Clementine Hunter was born legally free after slavery ended. She had multiple ethnic origins, although she was typically described as black, and she worked as a field worker and a cook for more than 40 years before becoming an internationally acclaimed primitive artist. And although symbolic annihilation exists at the site, it has a great capacity for escaping from under the thrall of Southern gentility. The plantation houses numerous paintings and other artifacts by Clementine Hunter, and it relates, it, and it relates her life story. At no other site that I visited is a black woman's life so central to the narrative. Hunter's heart art highlights values of black family, culture, work, leisure and pleasure, as well as the significance and the presence of strong and independent black women. We also see critical presentations of white power and the white power hierarchy on the plantation. 
Here in all of Clementine Hunter's paintings, men are small and women are big. Uh, here is an example of a drawing of Cammie Henry's son. Cammie Henry uh, was married to someone who bought the plantation. And in the 1920s and 30s, Cammie Henry was white. She turned it into a writer's colony. This uh, is a painting that Clementine Hunter drew of Cammie Henry's son because he was, uh, in her opinion, a wicked and, and, and vindictive plantation overseer. Okay. Okay. Uh, there we go. Oh, yeah. Let me say one more thing about Cammie Henry. Cammie Henry almost never drew white people in her art. And when she drew them, they are always tiny and in the background. And what we get from Cammie Henry, sorry, what we get from Clementine Hunter, from Clementine Hunter, is evidence of her subordinate status on the plantation. Well, at the same time, we hear her voice as a black woman who grew up deeply immersed in the belly of rural Jim Crow. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that the information at Melrose is central to the tour guides. It's not. Much of it is indirect, opaque, or diffuse. And one has to read between the lines, but it has great potential. A second opportunity for transforming the, uh, the information at these sites occurs in the role of tour guides. Most tour guides at sites follow pre-written scripts that privilege many of the issues that I've mentioned. And in that regard, they sustain the hegemonic narratives. They highlight key issues, tell stories, and point to important artifacts in the house. But they can modify their tone. They can change the information that they relate from serious and melancholy to humorous and frivolous. They can foreground issues important to them, for example, around gender or race, or race and gender, and they can show empathy. And during my research, many tour guides did this. In other words, they are in a powerful position to influence, adapt, or modify the general scripts, and also to shape, direct, and control conversations and discussions, especially where white and black visitors ask questions. Third, there are a number of what I call black, uh, plant, uh, black museum sites that uh, are managed or owned by African Americans, and that offer a stark contrast to the narratives at the main plantation museum sites. These black sites provide a far more accurate, comprehensive, and inclusive history. In Louisiana, this includes the River Road African American Museum. It includes the Arna Bonton Museum and the New Orleans African American Museum. These sites begin, sustain, and conclude their narrative in ways almost entirely at variance with the plantation museum sites. They often begin with information on life in Africa. They devote only partial attention to slavery, and they always privilege the agency of women and men in the civil rights movement. When they mention slavery at these sites, they directly confront injustice, inhumanity, and violence, and they foreground resistance, resilience, and the dignity of African American, uh, of African -American men and women. They also foreground the Underground Railroad. In all of these sites, African-American agency, initiative, and drive is at the forefront. These sites exhibit works by African-American artists, and they overwhelmingly personalize Black people. The sites reflect the long history of African-American commemoration, particularly in segregated communities and in churches and private spaces. And this image is the image at the front of the Tubman Museum in Macon, Georgia. It's not Louisiana, but it's one of my favorites. So I thought I would share it with you today. I'm going to bring it to a conclusion. The white South erected the ideological and institutional edifice of white supremacy as a basis for most of the prevailing and hegemonic narratives currently told about Southern history. This edifice is far more encompassing and extensive than memorials and museums. It was and is reflected in political debates, in historical accounts, and also in research productivity. It has always included extremist and fanatical elements, but alongside these extremes is an extensive array of more mainstream, more nuanced 
and more seemingly less virulent elements. However, I believe all are predicated on the same principles, alleged Northern aggression, the lost cause, an honorable Southern society built on chivalry, decency, and honor, a benign slave system of paternalist planters, faithful, complacent, and happy slaves. And central to this narrative was and is racism and gender, white men as the defenders of white womanhood against a perceived black male threat while they, were main, while they maintained roles themselves as perpetrators of violence against black women. And I believe that the active legacy of these narratives are revealed today in what our colleague Larry Rosenthal calls the, rage, the razor edged emotion and misplaced feelings of, disp of dispossession. Emotions and feelings of dispossession that are so skillfully described in Larry Rosenthal's recently published book, Empire of Resentment. A focus on the lives of the enslaved, the slave cabins they lived in, and the work of black sites highlights very different goals and provides dramatically different information than information and images provided at Confederate memorials. There is no simple unitary, there is no simple binary between the narratives across these sites and the memorials, but there are clear and striking differences across a continuum in the assumptions, the points of departure, the content, and the goals of these sites. And although it's unlikely that Confederate memorials were ever allowed for such alternative accounts, I believe, as I said, plantation museum sites do allow for that possibility. I first began empirical research on representations of slavery at plantation museums. I began in Georgia in the summer of 1996. Why? Because that was when the Olympic Games were taking place in Atlanta. The Georgia state government and business leaders were looking for ways to keep the millions of visitors in the state spending money beyond the games after the games had entered, as ended. Promotion of Southern heritage was a key mechanism to keep visitors inside the state. And after all, wasn't Georgia the home to the most famous plantation big house that never existed? And these are images, photographs that I took in Georgia in the 1990s. Since then, of course, the 1990s, times have changed. Plantation sites have been criticized, changes have occurred, and it's clear we can document vastly improved professionalism, at least at many sites. But my underlying contention or my overriding contention is that the underlying foundations of Southern gentility remain. Despite noticeable improvements, these plantation sites still fail to tell a full or fair or balanced or inclusive or accurate or comprehensive story. Their silences remain too loud, their evasions too obvious, their euphemisms too pervasive, and their marginalization of slavery too entrenched for me to be convinced of any fundamental transformations. And for reasons of economics, of politics, and of personnel, it's unlikely that the majority of these sites will realize fundamental change anytime soon. For most Ameri African Americans and black people in the United States, there are far bigger problems than museum exhibits, including police and gun violence, mass incarceration, poverty, and community decay. These are our priorities. But I believe that we are fortunate that there's still a number of dedicated individuals, institutions, and communities that recognize even in the face of such threats, we must still de dedicate some of our time and energies to providing accurate, extensive and inclusive knowledge about information, sorry, knowledge and information about slavery and its legacies. And I think we should be thankful that this small group of people continues to mount a fight. Thank you. Um, Stephen, why don't you stop sharing okay. and we can see, and we can see uh, everybody. Thank you so much for that uh, really illuminating talk.
I'm going to turn things over to Monique Oops. to um, shoot some questions your way. Okay, doke. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was wonderful. I am going to um, put some of these questions together because there are a lot of great questions about the narrative, about where it comes from, um, how it might change, how the existence of the Whitney Plantation that is centering the experiences of enslaved people, will that put pressure to, to shift that narrative? So I'm going to read some of these questions because we do have time to do that. Um, Kate Montana, the question was, um, can we draw any similarities? You know, I'm going to save that, but I'm going to tell you what it is. Can we draw any sim similarities between these southern plantation sites and Cali California missions? I wonder if children in, in the south do projects on plantations like I had to do on a mission in fourth grade in California. And that was um, a question that's related to narrative because I had heard that there were um, guides at the museum who are indigenous folks who who do make it clear that the work was done by by enslaved um, indigenous people. So that question is about the similarities between the southern plantation sites and the California missions. And then I, uh, Stephen, should I go ahead and give let you an outline of the other questions about the narrative? No, let me try to respond briefly, otherwise I'll, okay. I'll get confused. Uh, okay. First of all, I suspect that there are many similarities between these mm -hmm. sites and their treatments of enslaved and subordinated gendered populations. But I'm not in a position to comment on California missions. I've only read general information, and I think it would be a disservice to those who do research. But I suspect many comparisons, okay? Yeah. Do children go to these sites in the South? Absolutely, yes. Based mm -hmm. on my research, I believe the domestic population that visits these sites is overwhelmingly divided between people over the age of 60, mainly grandparents, and children under the age of 10, especially in summer because the grandparents had taken these children. So my colleague and I would go to sites, I would go to sites, and there would be 10 or 15 or more buses with 50 or 70 mm -hmm. people who were mainly old and young, overwhelmingly white, but not uh, exclusively white, and they would have school children. In addition, school children from local schools in Louisiana go to these sites, and they, you know, they are receiving this information, which is, I believe, distorting their understanding and their, um, yeah, their understanding of, of what slavery was like. Oh yeah, by the way, I didn't mention it, but all of these sites, every single site has a good slave master. I've never been to a site with a bad slave master. And at every site where black people are asked, what do you think about your slave master? According to the tour guide, the black people said, we'd rather have our slave master than other slave masters. I'm highly dubious about this kind of information. So that's my answer. We have uh, some questions here. One is from Zoe Silverman. Do you have a sense of who is producing interpretation at these institutions, as in which department is primarily responsible for the interpretive plan? Directors, board of directors, curatorial departments, um, interpretation departments, education departments. And you touched on this. Uh, talking about tour guides, but her question goes on to say, have you observed any acts of resistance to institutionally sanctioned narratives on the part of frontline staff, educators, guards, visitor experience representatives, or other institutional representatives? Okay. And the question from Howard Vassar is, what can be done to change the narratives on, on these plantations? Good and who are the you, people Howard. who need to have a change in in consciousness, who, who needs to be more woke to a less one-sided role of history. Okay. And these are, there's this part two okay. to that, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, of course, these, not, these are not easy to answer questions, but let me try. First of all, in terms of who's producing the narratives, we divided, my earlier work was with Jennifer Eichstadt through the early 2000s, and then I've done all the work on Louisiana by myself since then. So what we found is that there are three types of organization of these sites. Uh, public sites, which are national parks, state parks, municipal parks, and houses that are owned by local governments. The second sites are not-for-profit organizations that are set up with various kinds of volunteers and local communities. And then the third sites are private sites, when an individual may own a house, it may be a working plantation, 
It may be an active plantation. And there's high variability in the narratives across these sites. In general, in Louisiana, I think it applies elsewhere, but let me stick with Louisiana. The public sites, because they have local community representation, because they are uh, answerable in, in principle anyway, to local communities and government, they tend to produce less, uh, less problematic sites. They're far more likely to lean towards relative incorporation. The private sites, because they're private, do far less of them, okay? So there's variation across the ownership. Who produces the narratives? They're largely produced by, if it's public, by a board of governors, by a board of representatives uh, at the site, and then they are improvised as people go along. A lot of the tour guides at the sites are professional docents, but many of them, and I don't have the numbers at hand, many of them are voluntary workers and the site produces a narrative and then that becomes the basis and looking at the history of some of the sites, some of these narratives were produced in the 1950s and 60s and they've been modified in superficial ways, sometimes in more fundamental ways. Okay. The other thing is that, as I mentioned, the narratives are a script but the docents who are overwhelmingly female, identify as women, overwhelmingly white and Southern, okay? They can vary the script because after giving these tours for 50 or 100 times, they can vary it. So it depends on their particular interests of the docents and so on. Is there any institutional resistance? Absolutely. There are city councils in, 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 across Louisiana where uh, black and non-black councillors challenge the sites. There are professionals from the national state parks, from, sorry, from the national parks, from the state parks. There are government agencies. And also there are African-American institutions who in opposition to these, to the, the symbolic annihilation at the sites have set up their own separate tours, have challenged the museums. And the African-American River Road Museum, which I think is one of the best, was set up after an African-American woman was so infuriated about the, the, the narrative at the site that she opened the museum. Of course, the institutional opposition is far less well-resourced, has far less power and far less authority. So, you know, a struggle continues. I think, uh, yeah, I think that's my answer to those questions. So, you know, we have to do more of the same. Thank you. I think you may have incorporated some of Robin Marsh's question, which is, will the Whitney Museum site oh. uh, that opened in 2013 leak pressure the other museums to do better? It certainly will. I don't know about pressure. You know, it's one site. It's in Louisiana. The site was opened by a white man. I haven't done primary research at that site, but some mm -hmm. of my research assistants went there. And my understanding is that he's invested millions of his own money in creating that site. It's entirely exceptional, certainly for a white person. It's entirely anomalous. Other sites are aware of it and it will influence, uh, encourage. I don't know if it will cajole or pressure people. Why? Because several sites have made it clear, we do not do that. That is not our purpose. Slavery is not our issue. Talking about oppression is not our issue. And so it will be uneven. It will be uneven. I have a quick, easy one for you from Liz Williams. Curious to know if you visited the Cane River Creole NPS site in Northwestern Louisiana. Uh, I visited that site 50 or 100 times. And not just for an afternoon, I spent several months over several years. And my current book manuscript, which I'm currently discussing with publishers, is based on the Cane River. Nakatosh, Northwest Louisiana, has three very popular plantation sites, Melrose, Oakland, and Magnolia. And I spent several years visiting a number of months a year because those sites also have 15 slave cabins that are open to the public. And what I've done since 19, no, since 2004 or five, what I've done is I've compared how do sites with slave cabins portray slavery? And in general, the three sites I describe, uh, Melrose as symbolic annihilation, but it's very complicated. And I describe the other two as relative incorporation. 
in one of, in a couple of my recent publications, I mentioned those sites. So yeah, I spent my entire book manuscript looking at those sites in, in Naktosh. Mm -hmm. Th that's a perfect segue to this next question, which is from Mark Brilliant. Thanks, Stephen. Can you speak to the process, presumably contentious, by which the plantation sites of relative incorporation became that way, at least for those that needed to shift from symbolic annihilation to get to relative incorporation? Yeah, again, you know, there's multiple sites. I mean, there are, I, I can't remember the number of sites in Louisiana. Uh, that are that I define as plantation sites, but th there's at least 40 or 50 of them. And I'd have to look at a recent article. I categorize each of them and give the numbers in terms of my interpretation. Okay, so what's the process? Well, the process may be internal. It may be that the manager of a public site is committed to transforming the narrative. It may be that a docent or a tour guide is committed to changing the narrative either incrementally or in fundamental ways. Okay. Mm -hmm. It may be that the board of advisors, there may be one person or more people who say that they're not happy with it, they want to change it, they negotiate, they persuade the board. That can happen internally. It's also possible that people who visit the site critique it. One mm -hmm. thing that the tour guides sometimes say is that their white visitors don't want to hear about slavery. Mm -hmm. That's what they say. But several mm -hmm. tour guides also say, a lot of white visitors say, what's going on? This was a slavery camp. What, 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 why are you calling the slaves workers? So it's not, you know, mm -hmm. you know, at several sites, they call the slaves workers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some tour guides also say that the black visitors are uncomfortable with mention of slavery. Well, how can we classify mm -hmm. that? It, it's uneven. My interpretation is that there's multiple instances when visitors of different kinds express displeasure. So these changes can occur inside. But there's also external pressures that, that could, oh, the other internal pressure, of course, is in the private sites, if a person owns the site and wants to change it for whatever reason, pressure, more encouragement, you know, some sites think they'll get more black people if they talk about slavery, there are financial motivations there, okay? Mm. So they're all internal. External pressure could come. I would describe this certainly increased professionalism. And okay. many docents, you know, I mean, I visited sites from 1990s and sites that were symbolic annihilation, I've been back and met docents 10 years, and they said, look, we're really embarrassed. We were doing it wrong. We didn't know what to do. We felt uneasy, and we've transformed it, and it's more professional. We go to conferences. And there was a black guy who was the head of the National Park Service. Unfortunately, my head is full of filing cabinets, so I can't, re I can't remember every single black guy. Met. And he had an influence. Okay. Black people can have more influence. Non-black people also have an influence. So I'd say that, you know, that's how it can happen. But because the sites are so varied in ownership and in management, you know, it, it, it's difficult to come to a conclusion. And that's it. This leads me into um, Mia Hubbard's question, which is, is there an association or affinity group of these museums where they share information and can, poten can potentially influence each other's programs? Absolutely. I don't know the name. There are multiple, there are multiple associations of docents at the state level across the nation. There are also regional concentrations. For example, the person who mentioned the Cayenne River the heritage site, they have uh, conferences, they have docents, they have other professionals. Okay. Uh, there's also, although I haven't been part of it, I've done field work in Georgia and South Carolina there's also a Gullah, a Gullah corridor. I forget the exact name. There is a professional association. So that's so that those things exist, and and certainly professionalism is part of it. Yes, for sure. That's what I'd say. There's also international organisations. Yeah. There are a couple of questions that are about the types of sites that there can be. Example. Um, what do you think of the argument that a changed narrative at the big house is an appropriation of black people's story that still funnels tourist dollars into white pockets? That question is from Kathleen Bond. And then I'm going to ask you a question about other types of tourism that there might be at these sites. I don't have a simple answer to the appropriation of narratives. Mm -hmm. I think I'd need to give that far more attention. 
uh, it's implied that implied in that question i decide i i what that question raises for me is do mm. i want to see the narratives changed at big houses and my answer is absolutely yes do i want to see them changed in superficial ways no i do not do i want to see them changed in fundamental ways yes i do and i believe they should offer more accurate more inclusive and more comprehensive analyses but how that comes about and how that relates to to you know other activities on the site i think needs a bit more attention i'm very impressed starting from a low bar i'm very impressed with frogmore plantation and laura plantation because they begin at the cabins and they begin with black people as humans as agents who are oppressed who are exploited but who are not defeated okay so uh, i think that's how I, I would respond i think my research you know three four years ago at not away plantation indicated that they don't intend to change they have a cabin or they had one they're not going to change that so i think these are questions for discussion let me mention one other thing though that i didn't mention in our research in that we published in 2002 jennifer eichstadt and i that was a long time ago we looked at virginia georgia and louisiana and in that book representations of slavery in southern plantation museums we had another category which is called segregated knowledge segregated knowledge okay and that category we found overwhelmingly in virginia and i don't know that it exists in virginia and segregated knowledge means you go to monticello you go to mount vernon and you say why aren't you talking about black people in the old days they'll say that's not our issue these days they say oh yes good idea we have a slave tour on thursday tuesday at 10 a.m or there's a separate person so if you want that information that's where you go and we argued at that time that the reason it exists in Virginia has to do with the proximity to DC and the proximity to a larger politically engaged and reluctant to say black populations. I mean, black populations in the South are certainly politically engaged. So, yeah, so there's, you know, there's a wide variety. And for, if I was looking for ways to go forward, I would do what I've always done, which is ask black people because black people typically get it right and then others resist and then maybe come around so if you want ways to go forward for appropriate language for appropriate organization you mm -hmm. know you would go to the african-american river road museum you would go to the Bontemp museum you go to museums across the south and they'll mm -hmm. give you narratives in which you know uh, narratives organization framing which again I say is more accurate, more inclusive, and more comprehensive. These three questions, one from an anonymous attendee, are related to things that might happen at sites. Like, what do you think of, from Antoinette Chevalier, what, what do you think of the phenomenon of having the cruel bad slave masters featured in haunted tours? In New Orleans, this is a major thing. This is similar to what we talked about before we started about Rose Hall and, and the White Witch of Rose Hall. Um, Kate Montana wants to know, are the tour guides actors who are playing the various roles on the plantations, on the plantation? If so, are there black actors playing enslaved people? What do you think about this? And um, the third question is, what about f plantations that don't function as tour sites, but they still, um, you know, they, they function as venues and they're still profiting from the land and spaces? So one was about haunted tourist tour. sites but their venues what does that mean what's a venue if it's not a tour? Yeah, you rent them and have your wedding oh, there oh, yeah wedding or you have your events or you know that sort of okay. thing okay well i i don't think she'll mind me saying but dr antoinette chevalier it was a phd student she graduated at berkeley she's from new orleans i believe or certainly grew up there and she was my host when i was doing research in new orleans and in addition to providing me with excellent professional advice she showed me where to get the best food too at good prices <laughs> so thank you antoinette should we show bad slave masters and good slave masters uh, my answer is i don't think the binary is useful between bad slave masters and good slave masters i think all en master enslavers are inherently problematic inherently bad and this idea that we can divide them into good and bad slave masters can we have good and bad dictators can we have good and bad murderers? I'm not blaming Antoine the phrase. 
But this is a lot of the discussion at these sites. This is a good slave master. That they were all mainly involved. No, they were all involved in direct, brutal exploitation, violence, savagery. And many of them, it's well documented, were engaged in uh, wicked and sustained torture and sexual violence. So again, I want a more accurate, more comprehensive, and more inclusive analysis. For example, earlier on in the, in the, the PowerPoint, I showed a photograph, a drawing of an enslaved man with a gun. You will never see that at a plantation site. You will never see a black man with a gun or a black woman with a gun at a plantation site. Now, maybe there's someone who saw one somewhere. Well, you get my point. But the kind of images you see at the main plantation sites just don't exist. Um, sorry, the kind of images you see at black sites, words like violence and rape and, and persecution and torture, they're words that are used and mentioned as part of an inclusive history that I don't think can be divided into good and bad. Okay, what was the second one? The tour guides. The tour guides, you know, it's a strange thing and I don't have recent data, but the tour guides are overwhelmingly volunteers. So I don't think they're professional. There are some professionals that might be the site manager, the engineer, uh, finance and so on. But most of them are, are, are volunteers who are doing the best they can. And they may be informed, they may not be informed. Certainly comparing the last five years with the 1990s, there's far more professionalism and far more improvement. Whether that has just avoided the most egregious errors or whether they've done something fund more fundamental, I still reserve judgment, okay? There are things like, let me see, do I want to hazard? Uh, yeah, I was hazard based on my research, the vast majority of tour guides are white. They're women, they're Southern, and they're over the age of 50. They may be older. Hmm. I don't know, I can't remember what the percentage is. You know, we have it in the book, but I stopped counting that. Okay, but there are some black women, there are some black men. Many dress in period dress at somewhere like Oak Alley, at Nottaway Plantation. Others do not, you know, it's highly variable. Okay, are there professional actors? You know, I think there are. I think there are at Oak Alley Plantation. But what comes to mind actually, because it's interesting is in South Carolina, there's something called the Gullah Theater, the Gullah Theater at Boone Hall Plantation. And when I went there several times in the early 2000s, that was mainly African-American women, some men, but mainly women, who had a show and a performance of Gullah culture, African-American culture, designed to offer, again, a more accurate and more comprehensive. Um, and that site, you know, we described as relative incorporation. That site at Boone Hall, my recollection is that it was owned by a, fam a white family and one of the sons decided to make the slave cabin central. So individual initiative can be the key issue. Uh, the third thing at non-venues, well, look, they're all making money. They're all making money. Was it Ida B. Wells or was it, was it Ida B. Wells or Fannie Lou Hamer who said Americans love the color green? I'm a foreigner. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. But, that, but I quote an American. So there are weddings, there are uh, honeymoons. It's a very strange, I think, it, no, no, I remember in our book, we called it sarcastically plantation chic. The idea of going to a slave plantation for your wedding, for a celebration, you know, it, it, it boggles the mind to me. But certainly they exist, they're making money. Now, there are people scholars and others, including, I believe, colleagues in my department who talk about the afterlives of slavery. And in one of my articles that I published that we can make available, I argued that after making money by exploiting the bodies of African-American men and women, many of these sites are now making money by exploiting their non-memory. So I think that's my position. All right. I think on that note, we may have to uh, we may have to end because we're out of time. There are still a few questions left, but I think we'll have to wait for your book to come out. Have all our questions answered and more. Can I say uh, that I do have a couple of recent articles, and I'm more than happy to make them available if we have a means of doing that. I did post one of them in the chat, um, and it's also on our website with the event description. So okay. 
Uh, I'll share another two that give different kind of perspectives on, right. and also talk about sites outside Louisiana. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Monique. Oh my, it was a pleasure. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>